Lecture 2 for Chapter 13. Plantation life for masters and mistresses. Well, let's look at what plantation mistresses' life was like. Plantation mistresses were supposed to be pious, pure, chaste, and obedient. And in a lot of ways, their weak and dependent persona mirrored the slave relationship. And mistresses were supposed to be kind of like helpless women, you know, who could only achieve things through their husbands. As slaves were subordinated, so were the so were women. Women were essentially um, without rights uh, back in this time period. Divorce was virtually impossible. Property rights were impossible um, to keep when they were actually married. And and in a lot of ways, if a woman didn't like their husbands, they were pretty much stuck with them. Feminine education and duties. Uh, basically, daughters of planters' uh, education was aimed at fitting them to become true southern ladies. Uh, their jobs were to basically um, run parties, um, do social things, um, managing the household, as we showed you in the picture before. Slaves often raised the kids. Women spent most days at home where they often became lonely and discontented. Mistresses lived privileged lives, but they also had significant grounds for discontent. No feature of plantation life generated more anguish among mistresses than miscegenation. The, the fear that a black male slave could rape them. This was a very scary thing and, and something that, frankly, didn't happen. <laughs> it's a perpetuated myth. Uh, and here we go today with the fear of African Americans. Witness many of the things that we're seeing in the news recently about unarmed African Americans being shot and killed by police. Um, it goes back to this fear that these black folks are going to um, destroy and ravage white women. Plantation life for slaves was very difficult in terms of work, uh, field work. When slave children reached the age of 11 or 12, masters sent most of them to the fields the overwhelming majority of plantation slaves worked as field hands. A few slaves, about one in ten, became house servants. Nearly all of those, nine out of ten, were women. House servants enjoyed somewhat less physically demanding work than field hands, but they were constantly on call with no time that was entirely their own. Some were skilled artisans. Um, very few. In the Cotton South, no more than 1 in 20 slaves worked in a skilled trade. Most of those, however, if they were, were carpenters or blacksmiths. Still rarer were slave drivers. No more than one male slave in a hundred worked in this capacity. Their job was to whip the other slaves into shape and to make them work harder. Apologize for that. Here's some slave quarters in South Carolina, and you can see here that the living conditions are very squalid. However, they are provided for in some way, um, but certainly not uh, a nice way, I would say. Here's an image of a slave. Looks kind of like a skilled artisan here. Isaac Jefferson, just showing you that slaves did different things. Um, not all slaves worked out in the fields. Family, religion, and community was very important. 
Let's start out with family. We know that there were no court records of marriage, but, but plantation records show that slave marriage were often long lasting. The primary cause of the ending of slave marriages was death. But the second most frequent cause was the sale of a husband or a wife. Religion also provided slaves with a refuge and a reason for living. By the mid 19th century, Perhaps as many as one quarter of all slaves were church members, and many of the rest would not have objected to having been called Christians, uh, which means that most of them were Christian in some way. Slaves created an African-American Christianity that served their own needs and not their masters, and their faith emphasized justice. Slaves believed that the injustices of this world would be settled in the next. Slaves resisted. Slave resistance happened quite a bit in the form of either protesting in the fields, such as putting rocks in cotton bags, feigning illness, breaking tools, mistreating animals, or just simply running away. Slaves always resisted. Don't think for a minute that slaves were content or enjoyed in any way actually being at a plantation. The resistance started when slavery started, and that's something to remember. One thing about slave rebellions, um, which were fairly, I'm not going to say frequent, but they did happen. Um, in some states, slaves outnumbered uh, white people at least two to one. In, in some places and so this was a very um, difficult situation uh, that slaves found themselves in trying to overthrow a system um, in which the weapons were mostly held by whites however there was one Nat Turner who this is the most ferocious uprising that happened in, in the 1830s, Nat Turner went on a rampage, violent rampage, getting a bunch of followers together. He called himself the Black Moses. And basically what he did is he got a bunch of slaves together, went through um, the area, killed lots of people, and eventually was, was killed himself. As a result of this, slave codes and slave laws were strengthened to make sure that these types of things would not happen again. There were free blacks in southern society, but they had a precarious freedom. Um, the numbers, there by about 1860, about 6% of 4.1 African Americans were actually free. However, they were limited legally in the following ways. There were certain laws that denied the masters the right to free their slaves. There were special taxes placed on them because they were black. There were prohibitions on interstate travel. They couldn't go back and forth freely as other people could. They could not have their own schools. They were even denied the right to participate in politics, even though they were free. And they also had to carry freedom papers to prove that they were not slaves. In the next slide here, you'll see a picture of one of these freedom papers that, you know, anytime you are a government and you want to control people, you ask them to carry papers around. There was achievement despite restrictions. Um, for example, there were some advantages that free blacks had. Uh, for example, their marriages were legal. Um, most of them lived in the city. And typically they, at, in terms of class level, were at the middle class level or even the elite class level um, compared with rich whites 
Some even owned slaves as well, which is a little known fact. There's lots of evidence of that. What about non-slaveholding Southern whites? Well, non-slaveholding whites were the huge majority of Southern whites. Six out of eight million of them were, uh, were non-slaveholding whites. They held occupations such as, being, such as being tradesmen and small farmers. In the South, three out of four farmers were what were called yeoman farmers or those who owned their own land. And these farmers typically had small operations where they did a lot of the work themselves and by no means were they completely profitable. The profits belonged to the rich plantation owning oligarchy, you can say. And of course in the back country you had no ownership of land by the poor. And so the one thing that unites all these non-slaveholding whites with slaveholding whites is the fear and hatred of black people. And that is something to re remember here. That is the one thing that unites them because the, the northern, I'm sorry, the, the slave owners know, especially the rich ones, if the, to keep the poor under control, you give them something else to hate. And that one thing is black people. So, in a sense, what we have is a society that is very much divided among class lines. It's very much divided among slave and free. Um, and it's more complex than you ever thought. Thank you for listening.